Welcome, everyone. Welcome to all of you who are following us on um, the webinar, well, all of you who are following us on Facebook Live, uh, to a, another presentation of PBBI, the Portuguese Beyond Borders Institute at California State University of Fresno. This is a very special event for us uh, as we partnered uh, with the uh, University of Massachusetts Dartmouth um, and the Tegas Press. Thank you to Professor Mario Pereira for this opportunity. We are happy to be here for many reasons, and one of them is we have a, a very, um, an outstanding panel of uh, people who I've known and admired for uh, some for many years, others for a less amount of time. Um, and, uh, and so I um, would like to introduce our panel to you as uh, we are going to uh, have our first at the Portuguese Beyond Borders Institute's uh, book launch that is virtual. Uh, we were planning on having several book launches throughout um, a couple of at least each semester. However, everything is now virtual. And of course, at the California State University Fresno is with all the CSUs, uh, uh, UCs and community colleges and most of the public schools, uh, everything is virtual for this semester and for the spring semester as well. So welcome to each and every one of you, those following us on the webinar, please remember that you can go ahead and um, ask any questions and we'll try to uh, answer them uh, for you uh, when it comes to the, the book presentation. We are uh, launching a book that is from a very good friend of ours, of lots of, uh, we all know her, um, and um, a very good friend who I met in actually 1989, um, when, um, when uh, her and uh, my best friend since I was uh, in uh, high school, Vamberto Freitas, uh, actually took a trip across the, um, across the United States and then across the Atlantic and uh, lived in Ponte Delgada after that, after 1990. Um, we here in Tulare, or the community I live, which is south of Fresno, we launched a symposium that we had for 12 years between 1990 and 2002 called Filaments of the Atlantic Heritage. And the first symposium was with actually with the author that we are going to talk about today. Adelaide Freitas uh, was one of the three uh, authors at the symposium, Adelaide Freitas, Alamu Oliveira and Vamberto Freitas. And uh, then I had myself and the president of the Portuguese Cultural Center, and then we had two people in the audience, so it was a very big symposium. Uh, and uh, but from that, it grew to a very large event that uh, that uh, author uh, and good friend Catherine Vash participated, and saw how it was uh, it really flourished to an event uh, much different uh, six seven years after that. And so I'm very glad uh, I'm very happy to have all of you here. Uh, we're going to launch the book. Uh, Smelling the Darkness, that was translated um, by uh, uh, Catherine Emanuel uh, and a couple other translators to English, published by uh, the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth the Tegas Press. And um, so I figured we would just talk a little bit about Adelaide, very informal, about the book, about um, um, about your, your experiences with the book. We're, we're very fortunate to have um, two authors who have uh, who, who have read Adelaide, um, and um, and we'll start with actually with Catherine, uh, if she doesn't mind. Catherine Vaj is uh, quite well known. I don't think she needs an introduction, but for those of you who don't know, uh, Catherine is a uh, widely published author um, and um, has some of my favorite books, uh, such as Saudat, such as Mariana, such as Fado and Other Stories, such as Lady of the Artichokes and Other Portuguese American Stories and, and others. And um, uh, Catherine, actually, um, when I did my master thesis, one of her stories, The Hunt for King Sebastian, was part of my, hunt, my master thesis because it was, it was doing um, the, um, it was uh, focusing on uh, the ethnic world of, uh, or, or, or ethnic uh, uh, literature in the Portuguese and in, in the American idiosyncrasy and how, uh, it was, how you cannot be American without having some trace and some, some ethnicity somewhere. So uh, we'll start with Catherine. Welcome. So nice to see you. And uh, uh, obviously, ladies first. Well, thank you very, very much, Denise. Um, and hello to all my colleagues. Um, it's really lovely to be here. And this is a very special uh, lancemento because um, I think maybe not all your listeners would know that Adelaide Batista Freitas died about two years ago. And so this is, because we all were friends with her, something of a mournful but, but good occasion. I wish she 
could be looking down and hearing us praising her work. I read this book with a kind of an astonishment because it really is um, as close as I can describe it, like a howl of a novel. It's like a scream in a way to me. And in particular, it's a very female scream. Um, and I'm gonna talk just to, for maybe 10 minutes about some of my reactions to things in the book. It, uh, like t it's like a cross to me between Midnight's Children and Tin Drum. But um, I, as Denise very kindly said, I've written, written a lot of stories about my Azorian background. My father um, and his family were from Tursaida, but I myself was not an immigrant. I was born and raised in California. And Smiling in the Darkness is a chance for readers to flip all those equations and get a woman's voice who was in an immigrant culture, but in the Azores. And I think that there's, Shana is the main character who, with this wonderful sensory explosion of a book and this kind of color intensity, um, it's about being abandoned. Um, Shauna's mother had a very painful birth and left her almost immediately, went in this kind of um, Moby Dick style pursuit of the great white whale of American dream and fortune. And so this little girl is left in the Azores with her beloved Vava. Um, but there's a waiting. And I think American literature, especially nowadays, is very fond of showing children as empowered or bright or smart. But what I loved about this book and Shana in San Bantu in the Azores is that she's at war with the world um, and children are not really that powerful. They aren't. They are dependent on adults. They are trying to figure out what world this is. So she, she is swallowed in this world of plane crashes and earthquakes and rats coming out of, there's a kind of magical real, you know, rats exploding out of pulpits sort of feeling. There's this vivid, later in the book, vivid um, uh, attention paid to menstruation and, the agony and physical pain of it. There's a physicality to this book that in a way makes me truly have Sodaj and miss my friend, my friend Adelaide, who would sit around and laugh with me. She and Vamberta were some of the first to write about um, my own work. And I remember in particular Adelaide and I talk, uh, talking about seeing the world in color. Um, I wrote about that in Sodad, but this book really revels in it uh, uh, also. Um, the book does progress and there's this pregnant feeling of waiting for the mother to return. She finally does, but she's got this ogress in tow named Rosalia, who's this monster. I mean, there's the crone and the monster. There's mythological elements in the book that are quite remarkable. Um, and she's abandoned again in a way when her mother returns and pretty much ignores her. There's a triumph at the end, finally, that's very bittersweet. And I'll leave it to the readers to find it because I don't want to give away what that is. But I thought what I would do is just read a very, very short passage, two paragraphs only, of some of the things that show how beautiful the writing is in this book. There's, there are these explosions. There's, there's a tension here that's really quite remarkable. And it's like feeling trapped in a very particular female body that uh, is powerful and strong and it's like a shriek, but she's, she's stuck. Um, she describes at one point a pearl white butterfly alighting on the brim of her grandmother's hat and the agitation of the sea in Vava's head startled it, meaning the butterfly, which is just beautiful. And that gives you a little bit of the flavor of the book. The sea foam is like the laundry soap of mermaids. So it's this very lush book. Carolina is a wonderful character who's, I, I, I can't blame her for being, she's sort of evil. She's sort of there, they have real fights. Um, you know, you kind of hold your breath when you're reading it. But I just want to read this beautiful, very short paragraph that really celebrates to me um, the book. Um, uh, Shana, which is spelled X-A-N-A, -A, 
is angry at the failure of cameras. They would say, you know, watch the birdie and there's no birdie. She's, she doesn't want her pictures taken. She's angry about cameras. But her beloved uncle shows up, her mother's brother shows up and she just adores him. And it's one of the few deep connections she makes um, for most of the book. And she refuses to have him take her picture. She doesn't want her mother to see it. So she makes a scene. And afterwards, Uncle Joe took his niece by the hand and they both sat down on the low backyard wall. Little by little, Shauna began drawing closer to the camera and looked at it countless times to see if she could spot the cursed birdie that never seemed to appear. Her uncle took advantage of the opportunity to prepare once more to snap another photograph. No, Uncle Joe, Shauna squealed, ready to bolt again. But since she was very fond of her uncle, she lay her head in his lap and without looking at him said, when you come back to San Bento, why don't you buy me a camera that's a lot better than the one with the birdies? Instead of that line camera, what I'd like is one that's able to photograph people's hearts outside their bodies. If you bring me one of those, I'll let you take as many pictures of me as you wish. Not just one or two, but as many as you want, okay? Uncle Joe stood up. There was nothing anyone could do with this little girl, he thought in disappointment. But they sat back down and stayed a little while. Shauna watched his movements. She drew even nearer to him and squeezed his hand, which was burning with a cold sweat. She squeezed and squeezed it to see if the two of them stuck together. All of a sudden, her uncle made a tender, unexpected gesture, brushing his hand over his niece's face as if to photograph the feelings of a strong little girl housed inside a body of porcelain. That kind of captures, I think, the beauty of Adelaide's writing and the passion she claims, the bodily feelings of being a girl in the Azores. I've never read anything like it. Um, and I just think it's, it's just a marvel. It makes me miss my friend so, so much. And I picture her, I was at the University of the Azores briefly once and I remember her coming over and bringing me my laundry at one point and what joy she had and what a fierce love of the Azores and literature too. So this is for you, Adelaide. Thank you. She would love it. I'm sure she did love it. Um, and I know she uh, had a very, very special uh, uh, friendship for you uh, because she spoke of you highly, uh, uh, not only in, uh, in public places, obviously, but also in friends when we would get together in San Miguel. And one of my fondest memories is having coffee with her when Vimberto would go outside to smoke with that time, you couldn't smoke inside already. And, uh, and, and Adelaide and I would, uh, would, would talk uh, for, 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 for a long time. Um, and, um, and, and she was uh, indeed a special lady. Thank you so much, Catherine. That was beautiful. Uh, we'll pass the torch to um, uh, another writer, uh, Anthony Barcelos, uh, whose uh, novel Land of Milk and Money should be read by every single Portuguese American. Um, and not only every single Portuguese American, but Canadian American and, 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 other, and, and, and other people who like uh, literature and like a, a wonderful story. Um, but especially those here in, the, um, in California who can certainly relate uh, to Land of Milk and Money in many ways. Anthony um, has um, written uh, about, uh, the, uh, about the, the novel, about the translation of the novel, and we're so happy that uh, he took some time uh, to be with us uh, this evening as well. Welcome, Anthony. Thank you, Dinesh. Uh, unlike the other people on the panel, I uh, come to Adelaide's work late, but I was also there before, because I was friends with Van Bert in eighth grade. We go way back. And in those days, I, I still remember this very distinctly when the eighth grade teacher came over to me and Mr. Snow had Van Bert by the arm and led him over to me. And he said, Tony, Van Berto doesn't speak English, but you speak Portuguese. And I said, well, a little I speak it at home. It's my first language, even though today it seldom gets any exercise. And so Van Bert and I 
sat side by side in eighth grade so I could keep him up to date on what was going on. I was a translator for him. And years later, I find out that he's become a, a man of letters and a professor of literature at the University of the Azores. And it's this connection more than any other that got me involved with the translation by providing a, a blurb for the back of the book, which Mario asked me about. And I was very happy to do uh, because of my friendship with Van Bert, my admiration for him and what I had heard about Adelaide, I wanted to help out. Now, of course, unlike Catherine, I am a, a narrowly published author. Most of my work, I, I'm a math professor and most of the things I've published have been like in textbook or pedagogical manuals. And I have that one novel that Denise loves to promote and I, I love having him promote it because he's very enthusiastic about it. But that's my one claim to fame. I grew up in a Portuguese speaking family in the center of California. So I am a Portuguese American writer with one novel to my credit and a book blurb, which I will now read for the novel Smiling in the Darkness. Many people of Portuguese descent take pride in claiming that the word sodad is untranslatable. In reality, we come close with a melding of bittersweet nostalgia, bone deep longing, and an endless yearning for what one can never have again, or indeed may never have had. Adelaide Freitas dipped her pen in Sadav to tell of family separation and bonds that never loosen. In her authentic Azorian voice, she recounts the immigrant experience and centrifugal impulses that force people apart in spite of their desperation to cling to one another. In their sensitive rendering, the translators have captured the nuances of Freitas' novel, Smiling in the Darkness, with special care for those who have her native language in their heritage and heartfelt sadad for its loss. And Van Bert and I talked about it and he thanked me for it. And it gave me great pleasure to do this on behalf of his late wife and in the promotion of her excellent novel. Thank you, Anthony. And, um, and I promote your book uh, as everyone should because it's a good book. And so uh, if you have not read it, do it. There's, we're not launching a, a, a Land of Milk and Money again today, but uh, we actually need to come back to uh, and revisit it. Um, and um, I'd like to pass uh, the, the, uh, the, the torch now to uh, uh, one of the co-translators. So the, trans the book was translated by Catherine Baker. Uh, Bobby Chamberlain, uh, Reinaldo Silva, and Emmanuel Melo. Um, there is a foreword by um, João de Melo, a very uh, well-known Azorian author who lives in mainland Portugal, who uh, is um, who, who himself has a few of his books translated to English, one of them by Habasa, which is uh, uh, an achievement and a half to have a novel translated by William Habasa. Uh, by Habasa. And so uh, um, his, uh, his books um, João is, an, is, as all of you know, who know his works, uh, an excellent, excellent writer. His latest book is just uh, phenomenal. And um, uh, I should uh, kind of, um, uh, for um, to be completely transparent, uh, Catherine and I, uh, Catherine Baker, Kathy Baker and I worked on a, a, another novel before, which was, uh, that's how I got to know Kathy, uh, Já Não Gosto de Chocolates, I No Longer Like Chocolates by Alam Oliveira. And um, she actually was looking at other things to, to work on. Uh, and uh, as she mentions in, 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 in a note that she writes at the end of the, of the translation, um, I sent her a copy of uh, Adelaide's book and she took it on. And she took it on with, uh, with a group of translators and did a fine job. Um, and uh, unfortunately, Kathy could not, uh, she doesn't do this kind of technology and good for her because we get caught in doing it from morning to night. Um, but uh, it, we have Emmanuel uh, Melu from uh, Canada, from Toronto, who worked on the translation of uh, Smiling in the Darkness 
with uh, Catherine, with uh, Bobby Chamberlain and Reinaldo Silva. And uh, Emmanuel, if you, if you would like to take a few minutes, we'd love to have you tell us a little about you, how you came to the translation of Smiling in the Darkness and your experience uh, in translating this as being one of the co-translators with Kathy and the other two gentlemen. Thank you. I would love to do that. First of all, uh, it's wonderful to be in California, even though I'm not in California right now. <laughs> but thanks to Zoom, we are everywhere. Um, four translators for one novel is kind of daunting. But, you know, if we think about what Catherine Vaz just said about Adelaide, this is a formidable uh, Azorian writer. And I guess it took a team of people to actually get the work into English. So I, I am very, you know, very deeply honored to be associated with the translation project. And I'm also thrilled that um, Mario Pereira's team at Tegas accepted one of my photographs for the book cover. So my connection to the book is also through the cover and that's very meaningful to me. My introduction to Adelaide Freitas actually happened many years uh, before while I was visiting uh, Ponta Delgada in San Miguel Azores, we all know where that is. And I was browse browsing through books to bring back to Toronto books from Gilles. If anyone knows Gilles, it was a beautiful uh, bookstore, now gone. And I came across uh, a book called Nas Duas Margens, de Literatura Norte-Americana e Suriana, which is a wonderful book of essays that includes Adelaide's masterful dissertation on Moby Dick. Alas, I had not seen Sorriso por dentro da noite on the shelves, because if I had, of course, I would have bought it. So this is a, for all of you, anyone out there, I don't have the Portuguese book with me and I would love to have a copy for my collection. So if anyone has a, a copy and they're willing to pass it on, you can reach me through my website. It's thetorzorian.com or on Twitter through Torzorian. Torzorian is a mixture of Torontonian Azorian writer so I fell in love with Adelaide's writing and I even wrote about her on my blog in my July 28th post uh, called Adelaide Freitas from the Azores to North America, which was when she passed away. By that time, I had already met Catherine F. Baker, the infor this amazing woman that I enjoyed working with. And she assumed rightly that I would be interested in Surizu because the story of Shana, the 12 year old protagonist in Adelaide Freitas' heartbreaking account of what it means for a child to experience the fracture of family ties was really important. One of the strongest themes in the novel for me is the idea that you can't ever really go back and recapture the past and that the present is not always a better place. The damage has been done. There's a lot of damage that happens in this in the story to Shana. And I related to Shana because I too experienced the tearing apart of being taken from one culture to another, from losing beloved family members through immigration and the ultimate realization that something deep within the soul gets damaged or changed with that process. The ending of the novel has Shana clinging desperately to hold on to her world just as it is about to change forever. It's a profound moment that captured my own moment of leaving the island of San Miguel for Canada at the age of nine. And while my life has been mostly lived in English, I miraculously maintained an intuitive feeling or soul understanding of my maternal language over the years. Although at times it feels like a distant memory too. So this is the background I had. And so when Surizu, for me, when I read it, it was a very emotional read. Although Katie Baker is a very competent and careful translator, she only learned Portuguese in her mid fifties. I mean, that's incredible that a woman who discovers her Azorian ancestry in her fifties, picks up the language and not just learns to say bon dia, <laughs> but she actually goes and seeks out to, you know, to translate like tough Azorian, you know, literature. So she's, she's amazing. And I, and I, and I really, 
owe a great debt of gratitude to her for bringing me into the project, as we all do for her uh, championing of Azorian um, writing. So she had done a meticulous job and, I, and her other um, co-translators, but when I read it, I felt that the translation still needed some wordsmithing to capture more deeply the nuance, the richness and texture of a delight's lyrical writing. And so I, I tried to make some polite suggestions to Katie as to where to change a word here, a phrase there. And to my surprise and delight, she was open to my suggestions and invited me to collaborate fully on the final draft of the translation. We did this, of course, uh, through, she's in, in the States, I'm in Canada. Thank God for technology. We were able to, to work together uh, through email and, and it was great. So I had the text side by side, the Portuguese and, and the English. And so my job was to, to read both sides and see if it made sense. I suppose the first attempt at any translation is to try and get the words the sentence structure, the syntax, the equivalence down on paper as much as possible. It's like jigsaw puzzle pieces all in front of you. Some pieces are hard to make fit, while others are so self-evident that they lull the translator into a false sense of getting it right. It's also like seeing a painting in front of you with all the color foundation, but still in need of some additional uh, brush strokes some smudge maybe, or even small additions of color to fill out the complexity of the image. So that's where I came in uh, at this very final stage after the groundwork had already been done. When we completed the translation, all that was missing was its English title. Sorriso por dentro da de noite is one of those phrases that is very hard to find the real equivalent in English but we finally settled on smiling in the darkness. I think it's a fine equivalent, but for me, a native Portuguese speaker, the Portuguese contains a richness and a nuance that I can't really explain or translate. I can only experience it through a feeling in my most inner self. This is the challenge of all translation. It's not just words, it's, it's a culture, a people a geographical landscape. It's everything to do with how we identify and belong in the physical word, world, but put down into words. Given the beauty of Adelaide's writing, so drenched in local language, so poetic in its prose, it was indeed a challenge to get the translation right as much as possible without losing the lyricism of the book. I, I think we have done justice to Adelaide's novel, and I hope it will please those who will read it in English, that it will help them enter Adelaide's world to see it, to touch it, to taste it. In translation, yes, but still connecting with the essence of the original. I once wrote a reflection called Being Through Words, which I invite you to read on my blog posting. It's from March, 2018. And it's also been recently published in a, uh, just for those of you who are interested in these things, uh, there's a new anthology called Antologia Literaria Saturnia Autores Luso Canadianos. It's available as a PDF because of the pandemic. And um, you can get the links from our website. So I think I keep talking about my website because one thing Katie Baker taught me is self-promotion. <laughs> this is what this lovely woman did to me. She says, Emmanuel, you got to do it. So thank you, Katie. So in my reflection on the meaning of translation of not only words, but of the self through words, um, I ended my that reflection with a poem, which I'd like to end here, if I may, by Avelina de Silveira, who's a visual artist and poet born in Angola, but who lives in both the Azores and Canada. When I first read her poem, Palavras onde me perco, words where I lose myself, I guess. It was like having a knife stabbing to the heart experience, especially the line, já não sonho em português. I no longer dream in Portuguese. 
This is the painful moment I had experienced through immigration when eventually my mother language receded to make room for the new language of the country that became home. And this, I suspect, would be something that Shana would experience eventually, and that Adelaide would be conscious of in her own reflections of language and identity. I think this poem, for me at least, captures the heart of smiling in the darkness. And so I'd like to finish off by just quickly reading it, and then I'll be done. The poem is written in Portuguese, English, and French. I don't know if any of you speak French, but if you don't, I say dommage. Uh, but I think listening to the poem itself and this melange of languages and identity is, is I think, powerful. So it's called Palavras onde me perco. How I long for the days when words were essential. Outros tempos quando a palavra encerrava uma certeza existencial. Cœur et moi, moi-même, in a fabric of being. Foi há tanto tempo que parti. As palavras custam a vir. Como se eu as quisesse articular, mas houvesse uma pedra na garganta. A voz Lusitânia escorre sem que dela eu beba. Quais alien, porque já não sonho em português. Palavras, words, mot perdu, labirintos de imagens onde me perco, na ânsia de chegar à outra margem de mim. J'ai changé le profil du jour e j'ai perdu mon visage em ces temps. Never again myself, between the sea and the maples. Oh, tragédia de emigrar, de partir sem chegar, te sendo na diáspora um être ici e de toujours. Demain será um outro país, um outro matin, de identidade dispersa. I'll be searching in yesterday for the name of a water bird among the snow. Thank you. Thank you. And lovely way to end it with Evelina's work, which is uh, magnificent. Uh, thank you so much, Emmanuel, and thank you for your work on, uh, on the novel uh, uh, with, uh, with Kathy and, uh, and with the rest of the team. Um, and uh, we will turn now to Professor Mario Pereira, who is, uh, uh, from University of Massachusetts Dartmouth and who is the editor of this uh, collection. Um, thank you, Mario, for um, allowing us to do this joint venture uh, with Massachusetts. And um, we hope that when we uh, go beyond pandemic that we can do these things live. Uh, and so, even well, we need to get you to California. Um, and of course, we need to get Catherine back to California. It's been a very long time since she's here and she has uh, lots of readers and in, in throughout, uh, especially the central San Joaquin Valley. And, and Anthony is just a couple hours away here in California. Um, Anthony from Fresno is only about uh, three hours and that's just a short drive in California, right, Anthony? Absolutely. <laughs> so- Copy uh, of Sadat for Catherine to autograph. Oh, fantastic, fantastic. Um, and so we'd like to, um, uh, we'd like to uh, uh, bring on Professor Mario Pereira. Again, thank you for this opportunity. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, this project, but as, uh, the, all the other books that are, have been or will be uh, published. Uh, there is, uh, he is uh, director, executive director of, uh, of this series at Tagus, um, along with uh, uh, my good friend, uh, I think he was on as an attendee, Onesimo Almeida, um, uh, Professor Onesimo Almeida, the writer, the intellectual, the uh, university uh, teacher, the wonderful storyteller, the one of the, I'm not going to say one, but probably the best storyteller in, uh, in, in the Portuguese language and beyond. Uh, and so, uh, Mario, thank you again for this opportunity and uh, a little bit about this project and all of the other uh, projects that are involved in this series of translating Azorian authors and publishing them here in the States. Thank you so much for having me and for, for hosting this event. It's, it's really wonderful. I don't 
want to take up too much time. You know, as a as an editor, I feel my role is to be unseen. That's a successful editor. Um, but really, I just want to express gratitude to you for doing this, to all the participants and panelists here and everyone in the audience. Um, this is why we, we go through this and we publish books like these um, to, to make an impact in, in people's lives. Um, and you know, this book was published when the country went into lockdown and um, poor, poor Kathy Baker couldn't even open the box for several weeks. I think it sat on her, on her porch. Um, so so we're, we're thrilled to be able to do something here now with, with you and I hope we can continue to collaborate in the future. Um, I sort of see you as the, the perfect West Coast sort of counterpart home for, for this series and these kinds of events. Um, and I'm, I'm grateful to you for, for suggesting this book to Kathy in, in the first place. Um, I, my first encounter with the novel was when I started at the Center for Portuguese Studies and I found it on the shelf and I would leaf through it and read it. Um, it was a very complex, difficult novel. And, you know, as an editor, you think of books I'd like to do one day, you know, wouldn't this be fabulous? And you have lots of things to consider and think about and who would translate it and how do we go about it? And then one day in my, my inbox, Kathleen's translation arrives. Um, so it, it was just perfect for me. Um, and I have, to, I have to admit to Emmanuel here, when you know something comes in translated by three, four, five people, you get a little scared initially, um, but it turned out not to be the case. Um, so I was, I was thrilled for that. Um, but I also want to thank Vamberto, who has been nothing but supportive throughout the process, um, has let the editing take its course, um, and, and he's, he's really just been a great support. Um, I'm grateful to Kathy for, as everyone has said, being a champion of Azorian literature, being a champion of this book. Um, and we will be, I'll say in a minute, working with Emmanuel and Kathy on another project right now, um, which we're very happy about. Um, and again, Catherine Vaz wrote the original blurb to the Portuguese edition, and Tony, you wrote the blurb to our edition, and Emmanuel, not only did you translate, but you also provided the cover photo. Um, so this is just a, a wonderful panel for me um, to be on now. And one thing I will say about the series before getting into details is we have a partnership with um, Letras Lovales, a publisher in, in the Azores, and they publish they do their own design and they publish, print, sell, distribute in Azores and Portugal, um, all of the books in this series. Um, unfortunately, because of, you know, the mail system is slowed down with COVID, I haven't yet received the copy of um, the novel that they have uh, published for us, um, but it should be here soon. And, you know, hopefully when people start to travel again and people who wouldn't otherwise be aware of this novel, you go to the Azores, you go to bookstores and shops, they can stumble upon it and discover it. Um, but one thing I'll say to, to Emmanuel especially is they have reissued the novel in Portuguese, so it is available. Um, and I do hope people read both, both the English and the, the Portuguese because the translation is, you know, it's an amazing feat that you guys were able to accomplish because the novel, as we've heard, is not simply you know, complex and layered in terms of, you know, emotion and psychology and character. Um, but the descriptions of landscape and the way it's used to create mood and it's so symbolic. Um, and then just the lyricism and density of the language itself. The translators have a difficult job working on so many different levels to be able to convey what the, the novel sets out to do in the original Portuguese. Um, it's a very, very difficult task. Um, Anyway, I, I'll get back to the series just to say that um, when the idea for the series came up and I contacted Inesmo and we met and had lunch, um, he's been nothing but supportive. Um, as you all know, he's an amazing colleague and the series um, wouldn't be where it is without him and his support um, and, and obvious input. Um, and I also wanna thank the government of the Azores who has um, in the spring, they gave us a, a three-year grant to help support the series and, and keep it going, which we're, we're grateful for as well. Um, so I'll just say quickly, the first book that we published in the series 
was a translation of Vittorino Nemezio's uh, Mount Epinu Canal, translated as Stormy Isles um, by Francisco Calde Fagundes, uh, which was originally published by Gavier Brown in the 90s. And um, another thing that Nesmo has contributed is, is we've created not just a personal, professional relationship or partnership, but also on an institutional level. Um, that book, the first two books we published are co-publications co with Gavia Brown, um, and we'll continue to, to do that. And so not only do we commission new works of new translations, but we also sort of um, reissue classic translations. And this was one of the examples of Stormy Isles. And I hope you guys are able to do something with um, Kota Fugundij and launch this book. Um, I know we had initially intended to last year and things fell apart. You know, it's one of the, the most important Azorian novels and one of the most important novels in, in Portuguese in the 20th century. Um, and, and Francisco Cota Fagundes had, you know, over 20 years of, of corrections, of, you know, rephrasings, um, improvements to the text. And so when we told him we wanted to reissue it, he, he almost retranslated the entire thing. But I think the word files had long since gone missing. Um, and so he basically did retranslate it, um, which is amazing. And his introduction is very substantial, not only to the book, but to Nemezio as a writer and to the idea of, you know, Azorian literature, Azorianity. Um, and then the next book we published in the series, and this is two books in the fall of 2019, uh, was a bilingual edition of the poetry of Pedro da Silveira, um, a poet from Flores. Um, and, and we would like to do more bilingual editions. I think that's an important um, for publishing in the US because um, some people do have a command of Portuguese, but not well enough, or they're not comfortable enough reading poetry or literature or scholarship. And I think this is a way to help, you know, improve people's, not just their language skills, but their comfort level at, at this level. Um, but, but this, that, that, that edition of Silvera's poetry helps encapsulate what we can accomplish and what we're trying to do because it was mentioned in the New York Times as recommended as one of the books and translations to be read in 2019. And it was actually long listed for um, a pen poetry award, you know, which is astonishing for us as a small press, but also for an Azorian poet who wouldn't necessarily be seen in Portugal as a major Portuguese poet. Um, and, and so it just shows if we can get these into American audiences, what we can accomplish and the types of recognition that Azorian writers can get here in the US. Um, and then last spring, you know, when COVID hit, we published Adelaide's novel and then David Brookshaw's translation of the classic work of travel literature, Raoul Brandau's The Unknown Islands. Um, and that was the first book that got support from the government of the Azores. And so we're very lucky for that. And we hope to launch that soon with Inesmo and David Brookshaw. Um, and then this year we have two more books planned. We plan to do two books a year. And we'll have, again, Kathy Baker and Emmanuel have translated uh, another book for us in the series. And it's Natalia Correa's, um, I think we've translated it in America, I Discovered I Was European, uh, which is, which turns out coming back and reading it in 2020 is far more complex than I initially, you know, struck me as. We learned so much about her as a person, as a writer. We learn a lot about the US in the 1950s and, and lots of troublesome and complex and, and interesting um, observations. And then our final novel this year will be an, another sort of revised translation of Dark Stones by um, Diaz de Mello, translated by Gregory McNabb, who's gone over it and revised it. And we'll have an introduction um, by Maria Joao Dodman in Toronto. So again, trying to spread out throughout the community and move, get more people in Canada involved. So just thank you everyone. Um, it's very, it's very uh, moving and humbling to see you all here participating in this tonight. Thank you, Mario. And of course, with any book launching, we have to, you know, launch the book and actually find, you know, 
uh, tell people where they need to purchase it. I, I assume everything can be done online, right? Uh, take us uh, through Amazon or right. we always, uh, unwilling. We always promote, you know, the yeah. same company, but it's uh, it's one of the outlets that everybody uses. So uh, the, one of the good things about, of course, uh, take us press uh, is that uh, their books are available directly online. Correct. Uh, Martin? Yes. Yeah. Amazon.com or umasspress.com. Yeah. Okay. So uh, if you haven't, I know that uh, a lot of the people that are attendees, those who are following us on social media, we've had uh, a fantastic response on social media, over 350 views so far. But uh, those of you who are on the webinar, I think most of you have already, uh, other than some of the students, and I thank them also uh, for attending, um, have probably read the, the novel or have, uh, have access to it. If you haven't, please do so. Uh, because uh, one of the things, uh, as uh, Mario mentioned one of the things that's important about uh, these publications is we need to we need to get them out uh, and that that's always uh, a, a big important part of you know not just uh printing them but you know how do we get them to the readers how do we get them to readers uh in the american in the canadian world how do we get them to north america uh, to those readers of the english language who may be of portuguese background or also who are not but like to read a good book and so I think through Amazon, that's one way to, to, to get that out. So uh, we need to uh, work together and, and promote as much as we can. Again, congrats, Mario. And thanks so much uh, for your work on that. Thanks to Onesimo, who's still on. And so uh, as an attendee, um, uh, there is, there's what it looks like. Anthony, show it to us. Tell us a couple of words so we can get you on, on as a speaker view. This is the cover, which is based on Emmanuel's photograph, and the blurb on the back includes notes about the author and Kathy Baker, the lead translator. And so this is what you're looking for. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. And uh, uh, all of the, the attendees, if I started listing names, and I don't want to uh, leave anybody behind, but I think we could have had just put them all on the on the Zoom uh, as, as panelists, and we could have had a uh, complete uh, symposium of Portuguese American uh, writers and Portuguese American uh, professors throughout uh, the United States. We have people from Canada, such as Manuela Marujo. Uh, we have uh, a little bit of, a little while ago, Mario mentioned Francisco Cota Fagund, who is on, a very dear friend. And we, as soon as this pandemic is over, that is the first person we want to get to Fresno State, um, because Francisco has, as many of you know, know uh, a strong connect connection to the valley um, he's written about it and he relates a lot to our uh, to, 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 to the audience here in the in in the Central Valley uh, just a little bit of a story his um, his autobiography which I would highly recommend uh, hard knocks is um, is wonderful and when he first wrote it and when he was had it just as a manuscript before it was published, um, I had him at the time I was teaching Tulare, at Tulare Union High School, and I had him read part of it to the class. Uh, and it's not an easy book. And uh, to, uh, they were mostly sophomores and juniors. And for those of you who know anything about high school, sophomores don't really want to know much about literature most of the time. Uh, but for two years, those students talked to me constantly about Francisco Cota Fagundes and about that book. And most of them actually read it when it, when it was printed. So um, he is, he's on uh, as an attendee. And so I want to give a big shout out to Francisco Cota Fagundes and many others who are on there, including uh, one of our favorite writers as well, Frank Gaspar. And so uh, uh, a big shout out to Frank Gaspar as well. We're coming upon the end, and so I want to thank all of you for participating. I don't, there aren't any basic questions. There's lots of kind words from everyone of the attendees, um, and uh, we thank you. Uh, and actually, someone was just saying, you know, Hard Knocks is a great book. It is a great book, um, and um, and, and uh, so um, excited to hear of the future projects, Mario, because um, Natalia Correa's book. Um, I just reread it myself in, in Portuguese, not for any other reason, just out of pleasure. And, um, and some of the themes that Natalia touched upon, and I'm sure Manuel has found this is in his translation in the 1950s are so still, still so relevant today in today's America. It's, uh, it's kind of scary sometimes. Uh, so it's wonderful that, um, that uh, that book is being published soon. 
So again, um, if there are any final thoughts from any of you, I'd like to, if you'd like to share, please do. Catherine, thanks so much. I appreciate uh, your time. And, uh, and as a matter of fact, uh, those of you who like uh, literature and what, and uh, to, who like uh, the Portuguese American creativity, we're going to have a special panel on the 17th that Catherine will be part of. Um, it will be, um, in the morning, it'll be at 11 o'clock our time, 2 o'clock Eastern time, uh, and uh, I'll be sending you some emails about that. It's uh, actually a very special event that we look forward to presenting here on the 17th. Catherine? Um, no, I'm looking at just is a real joy to celebrate um, Azorian literature, and in particular, as I said, just that it is a wonderful, wonderful book from my friend. It's like an immersion. I would describe the book as not just a reading experience, but as an immersion. So um, I would really recommend reading it. I thought the translation was, it was beautiful. Um, I read it in Portuguese 20 years ago, maybe. I'm not even, I'm not even remembering how long ago it was. Um, but I felt like there was something about the music or the language in Portuguese that was immense. And, and the translation really captured this, this um, the volume of the writing, which was really, spectac really spectacular. But it's, it's so wonderful. I guess the nice thing about Zoom is I get to be in, everyone's got a bookcase behind. Um, <laughs> which is, I guess we've all learned to do that. Um, but it's good to see you know, all my friends here, and I guess the ones who are in attending too. So um, just thanks for listening. And this is a, you know, Adelaide, this one's for you. Indeed, indeed, Adelaide. We all, we all think the world of you still. You're still with us. I think she'll be with us forever. She was a, a very, uh, she was an excellent writer, an excellent professor. I don't think there's ever a student that didn't enjoy her classes. Um, and she was also, um, and she was also, as many of you know, part of the Azorian government. She was actually one of the first women uh, part of the PSD uh, political party in the Azores, as far as holding a seat in uh, uh, in regional government and, and and holding a seat in in their uh, central committee. Uh, Adelaide was director of the Instituto de Acción Social, which is kind of uh, what we might call here the um, social services for the Azores, and they couldn't have found a better champion uh, for uh, those in need than Adelaide Freitas, or Adelaide Batista Freitas, as we all know her. Uh, so thanks to all of you. I'd like to close with asking uh, our, our good friend, um, the um, Interim Associate Dean for the College of Arts and Humanities, who's joined us this evening, and that is uh, Professor uh, Sergio Laporta, uh, to kind of give uh, some final thoughts. Uh, and uh, thank you so much, uh, Sergio, for joining us. Uh, we appreciate it. Thanks to the College of Arts and Humanities, who is always present, uh, whether it be Sergio or Dean Nora Chapman. And uh, so he will have the last word. Oh, thank you, Denise, and thank you to all the panelists uh, for uh, bringing us uh, this wonderful work of literature. I, I unfortunately don't read Portuguese, and I do translate from other languages, so I realize how difficult the process it is, and this is a really handsome-looking volume, and your discussion has really, I'm sure, stimulated a lot of people to rush out and get it so that they can read it in English. Um, and I'd also like to thank Denise for his work with uh, the Institute for Portuguese uh, beyond borders. Uh, the Azorian community in particular is a vital part of uh, the valley. Uh, you may know the population here is large um, and this wonderful evening brought together people from the Central Valley and the East Coast as well as abroad. Um, but Denisha's work here uh, at Fresno State, the preeminent institution for the humanities in the Central Valley, is invaluable um, and really spreading the word about the contribution of the Portuguese and the Azorian community in particular to the culture of the valley, the hard work they did as immigrants in farming the, the valley and then subsequently in all walks of life in every sort of area from television uh, to the arts um, and, and business. And so we're grateful to Dinesh for all of his tireless work. Uh, he works, I, I mean, I, I don't think there's an hour of the day when he's not working. Um, and so we're very grateful. We're grateful for all, uh, to all of you uh, for your participation this evening. And we're looking forward to many more events such as this that will help enlighten us uh, to the greatness that is Portuguese literature. 
Thank you so much, uh, interim team. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Sergio, for your kind words. I appreciate that. And uh, thanks to our uh, sponsor, FLAT, the Lewis American Development Foundation, uh, who is an important part of what we do at Fresno State. The um, Portuguese Beyond Borders Institute, as uh, Dr. Sergio Laporta mentioned, is a, uh, is, a, is a collaborative work between three different colleges, uh, the College of Arts and Humanities, College of Social Science, and of course, the uh, Jordan College of Agricultural Science and Technology. And it's kind of a unique project because it brings uh, in these uh, three uh, different, uh, uh, dis uh, it's an interdisciplinary uh, uh, unit, and uh, but the College of Arts and Humanities has uh, uh, plays a very important part, of course, because that's where we have uh, our Portuguese Studies program uh, and that is that is coordinated by Professor Inish Lima, who is a whose PhD was done at uh, University of Massachusetts Dartmouth. So um, thank you all again. Have a wonderful evening. To my dear friends uh, on the panel, uh, and of course the interim dean, thank you all, and thanks to all of those wonderful attendees. Thanks, thanks for all the nice comments. Uh, thanks for all of you who are joining us uh, from from Canada to the East Coast, and those of you who are following us on social media as well. Uh, we will be back on the 17th with another uh, event. We have actually three events next week, 17th, 18th, and 19th. Uh, and so be in tune uh, to all the different events that we have between now and the end of the semester. I had a friend of mine tell me that, that uh, PBBI has more events lined up than storms that will be hitting California in the next few uh, months. And that's probably right because we don't have much <laughs> enough water, unfortunately. So thank you all. Have a wonderful evening. And uh, as Catherine said, I think the best way to end this is this is for you, Adelaide. We love you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.